we're going to get started, guys. Um, thank you so much for coming. Sorry, it's a little bit late. Um, this is Science City, and we're really excited that you guys have come along. Uh, it's presented by the Royal Institution of Australia, which is the publisher of Australia's premier science magazine and science news service, Cosmos, which all the journalists are currently upstairs. My name is Jacinta Bola. I'm a journalist here at Cosmos, and I'm convening today's panel of fabulous guests. So we acknowledge that we're here on the traditional country of the Ghana people of the Adelaide Plains, and we pay respects to elders past and present. We recognize and respect their cultural heritage, beliefs, and relationships with the land. We acknowledge that they are of continuing importance to the Ghana people living here today. We also extend that respect to other Aboriginal language groups and other First Nations. So Science City is a collaboration between the University of Adelaide, University of South Australia, and Flinders University, as you can see from these lovely banners behind me. Um, I'd like to welcome our fabulous guests here today. So we've got Tony Albrecht, a game developer who has been in the industry for 25 years. That's a long time in gaming. <laughs> he specializes in programming and optimization and is a principal engineer at Riot Games. Dr. Lauren Woolbright is next. She's a researcher at Flinders University who focuses on game studies and environmental humanities. She's also co-founder and lead editor of One Shot, a journal of critical play and games. Third is Abby Thirumakinam, so sorry, if I, oh, <laughs> a speech pathologist at the University of Adelaide who is currently researching using games like Minecraft to increase the social skills of autistic kids. And finally, Associate Professor Eric Champion, a researcher from the University of South Australia who focuses on virtual reality and virtual heritage. Um, just before we get started properly, um, should you need to use the facilities, you'll find the restrooms via the corridor behind you, just back there. Um, if there's a need to evacuate the building, an alarm will sound and we'll ask you to carefully make your way out of the building the same way you came in onto Exchange Place. Should you require assistance in such an event, please make yourself known. Um, it's also important to note that the event will be streamed live, maybe will be streamed live. So if you're uncomfortable with that, please um, let us know or, you know, we shouldn't be on you guys, but it will be on us. Uh, before we get on to our guests, they're, they're going to be doing a little thing. I wanted to get a feel for the room. Um, if you guys have, if you consider yourself a gamer, would you mind putting your hand up for me? Okay, so maybe that's like half the room. So keep your hand up for me, sorry. Have you ever played, for those that aren't gamers, have you ever played Candy Crush or any other game that is a phone game? That's some more people you've got, because <laughs> that were two hands up the back. Um, and lastly, is there anyone that got really into Wordle or even tried Wordle or, for example, likes the crossword games and things like that? That's some more hands as well. <laughs> so I think what I wanted to clarify here is that gaming and video games especially is actually wider than some people think it is. You might be a gamer and not even know it. Okay, so to start, we're going to get everyone to give us a little five-minute intro into who they are and give us hopefully a fun little explanation. Um, and then we're going to ask some questions. So there'll be questions with a roving mic. So feel free to put your hand up after they've done their little speeches. And then we'll be asking some questions, but I'll be asking questions as well. So, Tony, would you start us off? Sure. Um, I'm Tony Albrecht. Um, I currently work for Riot Games. I've been there for about nine years now, I think. Um, I actually started my um, game dev career here in Adelaide. I worked for Rat Bad Games back in the day. Um, uh, I think 1999 was when I first um, uh, applied for, for a job in, in games and uh, all my friends and family told me I was crazy. <laughs> why, would you, why would you throw away your uh, uh, an academic career for something as frivolous as games? Um, but yeah, I, I've been doing it for, like I said, you know, nearly 25 years now and I've, I've loved every minute of it. Um, now, what I do is I'm, I'm a programmer, um, so it's which is heavily logic and science and, and mathematically based, and I build game engines. So, in the five minutes of prep I did before I came here today, um, I actually I started I had an, uh, an idea for an, an, an analogy, and I started writing about it, and then, well, thinking about it, realised I was getting a bit carried away. So, I'm going to use what I wrote. So, consider game development as um, uh, the racing car industry, okay? Any racing car industry that you like. Players are the audience in this case. 
Um, art manages the the design and 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 uh, paint and art on the car and the clothing and and all the aesthetics associated with the car within the guidance uh, constraints of, of of technical guidance. Um, business uh, in games handles uh, sponsorship and funding. Uh, game design drives the car. Uh, gameplay programmers build the car from the parts and maintain it. Um, nowadays. You can get off the shelf engines like Unity and Unreal. You can just plug that in and use that, but using a, a standard engine, which is well designed for, for certain uh, types of games. But I build engines uh, from first principles, and I evolve them to suit the games that we build and, and run on and, and the platforms that we run them on. Um, game engines enable games. Uh, enables game designers to build what they imagine. It's equal parts science and art, which is why I think I like it so much. Um, the game engines define the constraints that help define the bounds of a game and the game itself. Um, it's, I don't know, the creativity involved in the game industry, I think, can be underestimated. Um, the, the whole thing with uh, science, technology, mathematics, art, literature, um, narrative design, everything all having to work together is incredibly powerful. And I think, um, I mean, the title of this is, is what, Emerging Games Industry. It's not emerging. It was emerging 20 years ago. Um, it's established now. Um, right. you, I, I have a friend who retired last year. He's in his 60s and he's finished like rolling out of the games industry to relax and probably program games in his spare time, um, which is what I want to do. <laughs> but it, it is an unusual industry in itself because it is often an industry of, of, of love and passion. Um, most teenagers, well, a lot of teenagers want to write games, but they've got no idea how to do it, but they love the games. So I suppose in the same way that they want to be a rock star or they want to be a movie star, but how do you do that? Um, so is that my five minutes yet? If you just, <laughs> I wanted to ask like games 20 years ago, mm. what were, like, what were you looking at? What, were, what sort of games were you making 20 years ago? Um, the first game I, uh, I, I wrote, and I had to, had to build the engine from scratch with that with a couple other people, was um, a kart racing game. Mm. Uh, it was World of, Outlaw, World of Outlaws Sprint Car Racing 2002. And so it was a, um, a dirt track in a circle, and you had it's supposed to be 24 cars, but we couldn't fit 24 cars in it because the constraints of the hardware was running on PlayStation 2, which is very specific hardware. Um, and um, yeah, we had to figure out everything from scratch, how to draw a triangle on the screen, how to texture it, and how to do all this stuff fast, and how to build the physics system. Um, and uh, interesting point, the physics system that we had came from a game called Power Slide, and all the units were in uh, bananas. It wasn't metric or imperial, there were bananas. <laughs> was a unit of measurement. So the vehicles were a certain number of bananas. So you had like a Newton banana meters squared effectively. So it was very much ad hoc. Um. <laughs> Are you, is bananas yeah. still a thing in games? God, I hope today? not. <laughs> um, yeah, that, that was the Wild West back then. Mm. Um, we really, and I, I see that a lot with, I see young people coming through and going into some of these, like, you know, Games Plus and other um, uh, collaborative groups where they don't know what they can't do. Mm. And most of them will fail, but some of them will do amazingly well. Um, and providing places like that to, to foster and uh, culture those, those people, to give those that do have the, the skills to get through is incredibly valuable. Mm. Well, speaking of teaching people to be able to gain those skills, uh, Dr. Lauren, would you be able to tell me a bit about your work? Sure. Um... Probably the best way to sum up what I do is that I'm interested in how games impact people. So that means how games represent people in them and how we see ourselves reflected in those representations, just like any other medium. Um, but also how we take up space in our lives actually playing these things and like what are the material constraints and the time constraints around actually doing play. Um, so I, I'm interested, you said, uh, in environmental humanities, which is absolutely the case. I'm interested in the environments that you can build in a digital space and how interacting with those spaces can alter your perception of something. 
Um, so uh, if we're thinking about educating people about climate change, for example, then you could simulate or model different scenarios in a space, or, or you could have um, people interact with things in that space and make changes themselves and then sort of take ownership of what's going on in a way that is not always possible in other media. Um, but I'm also interested in uh, inclusive game design. And so that means having as many different perspectives at the table as possible, because when you bring your creativity to game development, you bring what you know and what you love, what you're passionate about and your own experiences. And so it helps if there are other people there to like challenge or modify or push your experiences to make them into something better, into something more. And that's why we make games in teams, right? Um, every once in a while, you get a game that was made by one person, right? Stardew Valley or uh, originally Minecraft. Um, but the, I think that the innovation that games can produce thrives in a collaborative space. And so what I try to do as a professor is to um, provide students with opportunities to create games and to try it out, try out different aspects of it, the art creation, the uh, storytelling, um, and, and in other places they do the programming. I come from human humanities. Um, my degrees are all in English. So I'm interested in how stories emerge from play. So emerging narrative or like um, narrative that is not text-based, that is experience-based. Um, and those experiences can really change people and can change our perspectives on each other and on the world. Example of a game that you think did a really good job of doing that? Like what, what kind of games, I mean, Minecraft is fun, but I don't really think it would give, you know, those kind of like really, you know, important thoughts that come out of games. <laughs> sure. Oh, there, there are a number of really good examples. And so I've focused on gender in um, the early part of my studies. And um, so I wrote a 45 minute video essay, which no one should watch about Horizon Zero Dawn and ecofeminism. So Aloy is an ecofeminist hero. And, you know, what's what is her engagement with her environment? And that game, I think, did gender representation and diversity really well. Um, and you know, the storytelling, the way the story unfolds in that game, I also think is really well done. Uh, I also like A Plague Tale, Innocence, as the first one. And then, um, oh goodness, the second one came out, but I haven't played it yet. Um, but just so putting the player in the position of being a 14 year old girl who is not a trained combatant in a dangerous landscape. So we're talking about um, French countryside during the height of the plague outbreak. And so not only is there that, but there's also Inqui Inquisition soldiers coming after her family. She's a noble and her father was someone of note. So they're like chasing her and trying to capture her five-year-old brother. It's like a giant escort mission. If you played an escort mission in another game, you know, they're like one of the most hated kinds of quests you can do. But wow, this game took like a game long quest mission and turned it into an incredibly emotional experience where like your job is to protect your five-year-old brother and he doesn't want to hear it from you right he's a person and you know you're not his mom so it's just a really great thing to watch their relationship evolve and watch her deal with the traumas that are inherent in that scenario right where she's seeing death and experiencing uh, having to be the like the force that causes death to so she kills someone for the first time and it just really affects her we never see that in games we're killing all the time in games and just like think nothing of it it's just another stormtrooper right yeah before we go on um i think what you just described is would have been harrowing as a movie or a book mm -hmm. why do you think that video games are not treated the same way when it comes to these kind of expressive really interesting storylines, you know, despite the fact that they could be as poetic or beautiful as a movie or a book. They ask something of the audience. You have to actually take the initiative to sit down and play the thing. And if you're not interested in playing a horror game, you're not going to sit down and play Plague Tale. But you might sit down and watch a horror movie, right? It doesn't really ask anything of you. You are not responsible for moving the action forward. So I, I think the demands of the medium or the medium demands that you take action in a way that maybe if you're just trying to relax, that's not the kind of intensity you maybe want. You just want to build Legos. So it's Minecraft with 
<laughs> your friends, right? Or, um, you know, you want to race cars or whatever it is. Um, so, so I think that being participatory medium sort of puts people, I, I don't, not everyone is going to want to do that. But as far as respecting the medium and the experiences that it can convey, I think everyone, whether you play games or not, should very much so have all the respect in the world for the, the beautiful experience. Lost it. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Mm -hmm. And and became a show. Now everyone who didn't play it can experience it. <laughs> and the gamers are like, we know exactly what's going to happen. Like, how is this going to make us cry? And of course, the filmmakers know what they're doing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a really good point about how, you know, these kind of things, they can go from one to the other, you know. At, Video games have had a bad rap of, of being changed into movies or TV shows, but I'm hopeful that with this, with Last of Us, it might mean that we get more of these beautiful things in the future coming from beautiful games. Even the D&D movie was decent. Yes. Yeah, it was great. It was a good movie. You can argue with Chris Pine. Yeah. Okay. Um, moving on to Minecraft, actually. Perfect. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry for uh, having a go at it before. Um, Abby, can you tell me what you do and how Minecraft can be really, really important for particular groups? Um, yep, sure. I, um, I'm a speech pathologist by background and working as a clinician, what I found was that the amount of funding children get um, is not adequate for, you know, continuous practice. So I was interested in uh, um, using technology and what's available already that was motivating. So something like Minecraft or Lego, any kind of games out there. And can we use gaming as a platform to get people together in a safe space and um, help them build friendships, which is one of the things that the um, in my particularly in my studies, the, the participants who come to participate in the studies have said that the biggest challenge they have is making friends and maintaining that friendship. But creating a safe space and using something like Minecraft as a platform has been really, really useful. But of course, in doing so and learning more about Minecraft and learning more about gaming, I found actually Minecraft has been used in other therapeutic ways, like people have used it to um, explore grief and trauma using Minecraft and Harry Potter Minecraft in particular to talk about loss and grief and stuff like that. Um, a lot about um, self-expression and identity uh, development using Minecraft. The more I researched into it, I found that there's a lot of people using Minecraft. It's very popular amongst not just um, neurodivergent uh, individual, but also people, neurotypical individuals, everybody liked playing games. Um, and there's a lot out there. There are lots of social groups out there, lots of gaming groups out there, but there's nothing to show that it actually works. And so what I was interested in is, can we actually create these kind of groups? Can we set something up that parents can continue or the families can continue or the clinicians can set it up and people can continue so that the um, social skills and social collaboration skills will continue to develop and people can maintain that those friendships seems to be going positively from the little bit that I've done so far. I guess the thing about like we're kind of at two ends of the spectrum right we've got one game that's uh, very heavily curated to, to create a feeling to do all those kind of things and the other side of that is Minecraft is such a open world and so easy to manipulate to be able to do so many different things that you not only have it for you know, just playing around in, but you also can can use it in all these other ways, grief or and all this. Yeah. And I, I found that the way the participants have used it and, you know, we started to provide a bit more structure saying everybody get together, build a house or build a village. But then what we realized is nobody wanted to sit in a structured environment and just do what we told them to do. Everybody was, you know, doing their own stuff and then just getting each other to oh, come and see what I've done. And in doing so, they're actually building that friendship and they're actually creating. Um, and the best part of the whole thing is after every session at about, because it's a two hour session, at the one and a half hour mark, they're like, do we still have time? Can, can we still continue? And the moment <laughs> we say we've got 15 minutes, oh, is it okay if you go back and we just sit here and continue playing? Can we, <laughs> can we continue playing in this world after you leave? Mm -hmm. And at the end, you know, so we always want them tomorrow. Next week is going to be the last session and they're always not very happy. So people have continued some of these friendships. And one, you know, some people have said, I think you're creating best friends for life. And I think that's made a, a big difference. Yeah. I think this is really wonderful. But in my brain, I know that there'll be questions about, you know, whether it's from people that potentially don't play games and, and don't enjoy this kind of medium as whether putting kids, particularly autistic kids in 
gaming environments without face-to-face -face contact, is that as, you know, um, important and as fulfilling as contact where you might be talking face-to-face? -face? So we've done it both ways. So we've got the kids in face-to-face -face playing together in three different um, you know, devices that they own. So what we find with the face-to-face is, yes, they're playing their own device. They're all in the same world doing their own stuff. And then they actually come to each other and, you know, point at things. And, and virtually it's worked as well because we still have Discord or Zoom or something going on. So, and everybody's sharing screen and doing that too. So hopefully that's mm. working. I think one of the biggest concerns parents had coming to us is, are they going to get addicted? You know, uh, how is this going to... So there was a lot of strategies talking around it. Like we are not sure if we want to get, you know, them to keep playing and getting addicted. But then you have other parents who've gone, this is the strength. Like we're looking at strength-based approach and, and it's working well. So mm -hmm. we have not seen any negative versions of like if they were just playing in a virtual world, it hasn't impacted so much. This is just preliminary analysis at the moment. Yeah, I guess it shows that, well, I mean, again, I think the people that play games know this, but it is significantly more social and, yeah. you know, it is more of a community than, than some people think it is. Yeah. Eric, mm -hmm. we've finally reached you. <laughs> um, so we've got a couple of slides. You've got the thing there. Um, and can tell me what you do and how this all works. What do I do? That's a, okay, good question. <laughs> um, my background's a bit weird. I, I studied architecture and philosophy, and my PhD is technically in engineering, but actually was doing Mayan archaeology with Lonely Planet, and that's with good game design. <laughs> so um, I'm interested in combining my background, but my big interest is really watching people play games. Why do we play games? What, what really make, makes us learn about them? What makes them challenging? And I've moved from helping people design games to, for other people to play, to people learning through the design itself. So because I work with people, archaeologists and architects, I found that um, them learning how to design a game for others is great, but them learning about the subject through the design of the game itself is even greater. Um, so my PhD is really weird because Lonely Planet found they had a virtual tourist over 20 years ago. They were, they were asked to write a book on a war zone that no one was going to, and they went, oh, we have virtual tours. So um, they asked my supervisors, well, actually, I wasn't part of it yet, but they asked two people from engineering and architecture, can we look at internet tourism? And they asked me to start this scholarship with Learning Planet, who were a Melbourne company. And um, it turned out that the, one of the three archaeologists who wrote the Mayan language code is from Adelaide. Yeah, it's not well known now he's retired, but the Mayan language and, and Mexico and, and areas around there, the local people didn't even know how to read their language, the culture, their art. And he and two other people, while he was based in Canada, actually worked out, interpreted it, and created the, the working language back for them. And I found out about him because Lonely Planet had said, we have these hundreds of books and language guides and software, and you can, you can choose any way you want. And the, my supervisor said, you can do internet, you can do tourism, and 3D, and you can choose anything you like. So I found this guy and I said, let's do an online multiplayer version of a Mayan civilization. And he said, that's great. And um, the more I, I, I looked into the software, which doesn't exist anymore, even though it was run by a giant software company, um, the, the, the more I thought we can actually use this, not to show people what is there now, but to show people how people used to inhabit and understand their site. So when I started looking at this, Games were mostly, games from an academic point were mostly about, they were trying to be like virtual reality and virtual reality was trying to be like, let's recreate what we can already do. And I've actually been interested in virtual reality since about 1990. I was building roads in Japan, don't ask, but they had a VR exhibit in a furniture showroom. And when I put on these goggles and this uh, glove, it was about 1990, and I felt water as I walked through this house. I went, wow, architecture is dead. We don't need architects anymore. Anyway, architects now in Adelaide this year are looking at games to build airports for people with phobias and things like that. So it's really exciting. But VR in the old days was trying to recreate what we can do now. And even then I thought, why can't we use VR to explain processes and things which no longer exist or from different points of view? So the, the problem is virtual reality implies everything has to be about reality now. But when you look at games, it's much more about experiential realism. We don't have to create photorealism. But the day after you've played the game, did it feel like you were actually there? 
And that's one of the really interesting things about games. You don't have to have huge photorealistic elements and pixels, et cetera, but you have to create an environment in which people add in and fill in the gaps. So that's, that's one of the reasons I'm really interested in games. But another reason, when I started building my Mayan environments and I was testing archaeologists, there were first-year archaeologists, there's like 100 of them. Instead of saying, uh, what is this object? How does it relate to history? They were saying, where are the weapons? Can I change clothes and can I kill people? And I thought, these are archaeology students. <laughs> so it was over 20 years ago. But um, the second thing was I asked them if they felt challenged. And the problem in the English language is challenge means two totally opposite things. So uh, a challenge is something that's really difficult and you don't want to do, or with a game, it's something really difficult and you really want to do it. So I think education doesn't tend to be the second one, unfortunately. But yeah, so when you ask people, is this challenging? You don't know if they say it's challenging and it's good or it's challenging and it's bad. And then later I read by one of the founders of Atari that the difference between games and software is Software is supposed to be easy to learn, easy to master. Games are easy to learn, and difficult to master. And that's partly one of the reasons educationalists often don't build really good serious games. Because it's really hard getting that game balance and getting you intrigued a bit more. So um, I might show a few projects. I, I've been very lucky. I go around the world to places like Italy and Qatar and um, the United States, et cetera. And I sit around with these archaeologists who traps around pyramids and jungles. And I say, let's build a virtual game together. And um, it's really interesting. But what's much more important is what is the knowledge and how do people share it beyond the game? So that's what I'm going to try and move to. But these projects, these are just some of the projects, some of the workshops people do. You can move from paper and clay to build physical models or virtual models. The, the really important thing is understanding that not what it looks like, but the mechanics of how does it move forward. So that's what I've been trying to do in my research. But I also look at augmented reality and mixed reality because one of the great things for tourist sites with augmented and mixed reality, you don't have to recreate everything. You're just adding on top and you're not necessarily touching and destroying it. Because one of the problems with VR headsets, for example, and I think some of you might have noticed this in the COVID era, it takes up to half an hour to clean it up. The last person has used it. Um, but with mixed reality, one of the most interesting things, um, and I don't, you probably can't see it very well. And the top middle one is in the a, a shipwrecks gallery in Perth. Um, so you, with a HoloLens or something like that, you can walk around a museum. You can see these things floating around you. You can, you can make them appear, disappear, animate. You can control them with your voice. That's not the exciting thing. To me, the exciting thing is if two people have headsets and they see the same physical world, but they see slightly different mixed reality versions on top. So they have to talk to each other to see each other's perspective. Does that make sense? So to me, VR and, and mixed reality, it's not just about what's recreating what's there. It's about how people can share and understand from it. Um, the top left is not very obvious. I've been cut off, but we've also used things like biofeedback. So depending on how you feel, the whole experience changes or the music changes and how does it affect the person? Um, we can also have screens whereby you stand in front of them and your skeleton is captured and the non-playing characters mirror you and what they do actually controls the scene. So um, the movie's not working in the bottom middle, but we can also use VR and mixed reality so that two people say control the same virtual body. And they don't even realize what each other is seeing, but they actually have to work out how to collaborate and coordinate with each other. Um, so yeah, so I'm, I'm very interested now also in escape rooms. So we've just built so the Mixed Reality Demo. See, this is just, I also teach game design at UniSA. Um, one of the interesting things about mixed, um, about escape rooms is that they can be physical and they can be virtual. And these students, and there were just five of them actually built um, in MOD, the museum. They built a physical puzzle and you're a security guard. There's four of you. You're, it's your first day on the job on another planet. Um, you're left with these clues you have to interpret, and there's an alien trying to get in. So it's a reversed escape room. But they also have physical puzzles that they have to solve, and they can only solve them together. That's one of the interesting things about escape rooms for me. So how's that for five Yeah, minutes? that was great. I really liked it. So for those who, um, like augmented reality and things like that, that would be um, a really good example of that is probably Pokemon Go. So, you know, you're seeing the real world through your phone, but you've also got a Pokemon in there that you have to try and catch. So, I mean, I think it's really cool that you're able to use these kind of, I mean, 
they're not simple technologies, but they're really interesting technologies to be able to look at the world in a completely new way. I really want to try that escape room as well. <laughs> Let's go to mod afterwards and see if we can get out. <laughs> um, okay, cool. So what we're going to do now is we're going to ask people to ask some questions. Um, there'll be a roving mic. So if you want to ask a question, pop your hand up. Um, while we do that, I'll ask another question of our lovely panel. Um, I think the, the question I wanted to ask first up is one that I think you'll all be able to look at in a different way. Um, what are some misconceptions or what's the biggest misconception that you get about video games? Tony, do you want to start? Do I have to start? <laughs> I mean, if someone else really wants to jump in, Eric, what, what's the biggest misconception you get about video games? Me? Um, well, originally from architects, they would say there are not enough pixels. And I would say, how many pixels do you need? And they would not be able to answer me and got angry. So, but yeah, I, I actually, my first game I designed was over nearly 40 years ago. That was text-based. But it, it seems to me the, the, one of the biggest criticisms, and it's, it's changing now, is games are not serious. They're, they're trivial, according to them. And I say, so the sport you watch is trivial, and they get angry again. So, <laughs> so yeah, I think one of the big problems, though, is that there's so many things that we do for games, non-digital games, that we learn about culture, et cetera we haven't moved all of that to the digital realm because the interactive mode is very, it's very re refrained. And a lot of games are played for a joystick or a keyboard or a mouse. So what we've done is say, we've used dance mats. So you walk on them to explore. We've used all sorts of devices built into objects. I want to build a biofeedback climbing wall, for example. That's another story. So but giving away my secret now, but you know, those little mood rings that you, you sometimes buy as kids, it's a simple form of biofeedback. Imagine if it was actually put into the hooks and the grapples of the climbing wall. And then depending on how, how people are changing the mood rings, it would actually affect the external environment. Oh, that's cool. No, but what I'm saying is, so there's so many different ways we can interact with the world. Yeah. Well, we built this. Uh, there's some students took my, my um, Mayan villages and they put it into Unreal. This is over 20 years ago. And they, they had a dance net. So you walk on it to move. You have a 3D joystick that has no wires. And then we used a curved mirror so it projects on the walls and the ceilings around you. And I got rung up late at night by one of them said, I've got, I've got birds flying on the ceilings. And, and he understood then the spatial immersiveness. But then we had these children go through it and we're totally scared. So actually, to be honest, the mind world is very scary. <laughs> but, but yeah, so there's so many different ways we can interact. And we still haven't fully explored smell, haptics, and also sound. So, like, for example, a lot of the archaeological sites, are, uh, they're acoustic as well. Um, so there's some sites in, in the jungles in South America where if you clap your hands, you hear the sound of a bird coming back. And people go there and go, let's have LIDAR and photogrammetry and make this really accurate model. But they don't have the experience of actually going there. So if you go to Florence and Pisa, for example, and the, the baptistry at the back of the Leaning Tower, if you sing a certain note, you get this amazing echo, and it's actually an accident. But there's all these different acoustics that we haven't actually incorporated into these visualizations. Mm, for sure. Abby, what do you think biggest misconception about video games? I think it's the fact that people think, it, you know, you can get addicted and that it's, that's, I think, the biggest um, misconception. But in terms of challenge, I think just connecting everybody, like, you know, every, if anybody, if people are using different devices and everything, just getting everybody connected, everybody having the right account, everybody using the te technology properly. That's been a big challenge, which then also then people don't want to, oh, this is just taking too long. It's too hard. That's been the other big misconception, like it's too hard. Mm -hmm. um, but not everyone. Like I said, some people are finding that there is a lot of benefit, particularly in something like Minecraft, because it's being used at in schools, um, education Minecraft. And actually speaking of that, Laura, that I read some, I read a news article that recently came out how in Victoria they're actually using Minecraft as a tool for kids to learn about climate change and building societies and stuff like that. Yeah, there's a game called Eco that was a mod of Minecraft that became its own game, and it's designed for like a classroom of middle schoolers or I guess year seven through nine. <laughs> we know what you mean. I just moved here less than a month ago, um, and uh, you're supposed to work collaboratively to create laws and policies to govern how you will manage the space. Mm. Um, but you have this other constraint where uh, there's a meteor heading toward the planet and you have to build your technology up enough that you can just destroy it. But if you've completely polluted the planet in the process, then what's the point in having it? 
right? You, you've poisoned your own world and you're going to die slowly now. Um, and so you have to balance with each other. How are we going to make sure that we can actually save our planet, but also not destroy in the process? Intense questions for yeah. some seven to year nine. Oh, yeah. and it's really crazy to watch them argue about it with each other. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What about you? What do you think your biggest, mis what's the biggest misconception in games? I guess what it really boils down to is games are not for me, whoever is the person who's coming to me. Um, oftentimes parents, because I'm a parent, I have three kids and we play games together all the time and it's Minecraft or it's Little Inferno or it's anything. Um, and I guess there's a lot of fear. If you haven't grown up with games or you haven't made games a priority, and you haven't developed that literacy because there is a, a media literacy to games. Once you've managed an inventory and leveled up with a skill tree, then you know how to do like how the basic like leveling up mechanics work in any number of other games because they use the same logics. Um, and so if you haven't got that, and especially if you're playing with someone who knows what they're doing, you can feel like this is never going to be something that I can do. This is never going to be a space for me. But there are just so many thousands of games being made all the time. There's a game out there for you, for whatever you want, right? There, it's not just GTA. Um, but if you like GTA, there's that. You've got it. Good job. Um, uh, the other misconception is just that games are violent and they make people violent. And that's a terrible misconception. So either they're trivial or they're too, or that, yeah, or the, they will cause you to be antisocial or have these problematic behaviors. And the science on that just doesn't bear out. Um, there was a study that was meant to refute that. Um, they had studied folks who were playing GTA and playing Fable, uh, which is like an adventure game. And basically, it, it, even like pay, playing Tetris, if you're playing anything that gets your heart rate up, researchers were misconstruing that as aggression. And like, I don't know if you've ever played Tetris, <laughs> but boy, will it get your heart rate going. Uh, and you're like, nah, and then you're angry. Maybe you throw your phone. I don't know. Um, but you're not going to like go shoot someone, right? And the vast majority of us are not going to. Like games can definitely amplify problematic behaviors, but they were already there. And so it's not fair to blame games or game developers for those things. And um, games can be used for so much good. Have you, have you thought about it, Tony? Yeah, I have. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I absolutely agree with Lauren. The whole thing with about... I don't like games. I'm saying I don't like books. I don't like okay. movies. I don't like music. What kind of even reading? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> there is something there, but there, there is a, um, a definite constraint with the the medium that you use to interact with the game, and there's a, a whole lot of um, literacy based around that as well. Um, so yeah, that, that's something that kind of bugs me. Uh, again, blaming uh, violence on games. I think they're trying to do that in, in France at the moment saying that's due to games as well, which is ridiculous. Um, the other one is um, the seriousness of games. Um, uh, at, at Riot, I work on uh, an eSport, uh, League of Legends, and it's a game that's played, one of the biggest games in the world. There's millions and millions of people playing it at any one time, and they have these... It is. It's an arena sport. It is. It is. If you To see one of these games played in an arena, massive screens, players up there playing it, but they don't look like your, your jocks. They're not big buff guys generally, you know? They're a little bit weedy nerds, but they're really good at what they do. Um, and the number of people that watch the, the World Championships for League is far more than will ever watch AFL or any of the, the Aussie stuff. It's one of the, I think it was number three in America, like for World Championship sports. But taking that seriously, when it's not a physical sport, because so much of us, uh, our, our game and play and, and, and um, uh, entertainment is around physical sports, about big people doing big things. Uh, and it's that this, this twist to slightly weedy people, a little bit pudgy, doing amazing things. But there's a, there's a gap there as well in that if you don't know how the game works, like you're not going to appreciate AFL if you don't know the rules, unless you're like short shorts or something, you know? Um, <laughs> So yeah, there's, there's just that gap of literacy. And I think that's happening as, as all the old people die and the young people come through that have grown up with games. 
yeah, the literacy can. with younger people, they just pick it up really quick. quick. The, Older people can pick it up too, though. It's not. Yeah, but I, in exclusive. the sense that the, the rate of, like, you can't, no. like, they're really quick, which is another another strength, I think. Like, this, yeah. Touch screens are so intuitive. You can mm. hand one to a two year old and they know exactly what exactly, to do. Exactly. Yeah. And they will play with it until they <laughs> messed up all your settings and changed everything. I think the other thing with esports that I think is quite interesting is I don't think people know how much money they make as oh. well. Like people are making a much more than even some really high profile sports stars in these arenas. If they win, it's it's a very big deal. It's huge in South Korea. Mm. Absolutely massive. Yeah. As celebrities. Okay, have we got any questions? Have we got anyone? Um, Yeah, well, I think, I mean, we'll, we'll go to some of the things that we've, that about, you know, potentially how it can be used in, in the real world. Um, but it is maybe an important point as well about <laughs> like you know are, can we get into video games too much can people be too into it are we are we not going to go outside yeah but moderation you know i've been playing games since the early 80s and i'm re relatively well adjusted <laughs> um <laughs> yeah, my wife's laughing at me now <laughs> and I, I i i love games but then you know you, you can also be absorbed in a book but that's not seen as a negative, you know, um, not usually anyway. Um, you can listen to music all the time. Is, is that a problem? But I think you can enjoy games and also enjoy walking in, in the countryside and, and physical exercise and, and swimming and all those things. They're not exclusive of each other, you know. Um, so th th I don't think you want to exclude games from someone's uh, sphere of entertainment. Um, it is, it's complimentary. As a parent, you need to make sure that your kids do get out and do some things that are physical and uh, good for their health, physical and mental. Um, but I don't think we can, we need to worry too much about games, uh, more than we worried about rock and roll causing devil worship in our youth back in the 80s or D&D &D causing, yeah, oh, I remember those days. <laughs> How um, video games can be used to in physical space so, you know, maybe potentially we talked about the climate change one before. Are there any more examples of things where it might actually be really helpful to be able to use a video game to then be able to go into the real world? Um, that you can use um, video, video games to actually teach skills and then see how that translates to real world because here you have a simulated environment. So it's a safer space to learn and make mistakes and then just try it out. After. And I think they've done that quite well. Um, um, sorry, flight, flight simulator is another example of that. Yeah, so actually, look, I was in school in the early 2000s and we were using typing games to be able to learn how to type. And so I think like this has actually been a thing for many, like many, many years now. Um, and I, yeah, it's I'm really glad I learned how to type for a game. <laughs> it was quite fun. Does anyone else have any thoughts on this? <laughs> there were about four questions from here and this all moves like what yeah. question do you want me to answer what, what do you what do you vibe with the most <laughs> <laughs> no, the questions changed again um i personally like physical games and i love games where you share with people we've we've designed games 
far we've designed augmented reality where you go out into nature and it tells you with different languages of what you're looking at etc i want to build a game in fact i'll never build it but someone here might one day for me chinese language is really hard to learn it's got all these different tones so up there and down the same character how do you pronounce it and i finally worked out i think a way of doing it is to do a kung fu game so as you're actually doing the intonation the syllables you're doing the kung fu motions and your muscle memory will teach you how to play the chinese so there's there's lots of ways that we can use the body and we can work with nature etc to do this um but what what games most vibe with me i just like watching people design games and talking to each other about it so i think one great attribute of game design is it's not just learning how to navigate a virtual environment, it's understanding how other people do it. So when I first taught game design, the students would design a game and they'd have to test each other's games. Because if you design your own game, you think, oh, this is how you do it, blah, blah. And you forget about beginners. You forget about different ways of exploring. And the best games allow you different ways of solving it. Right? Mm. So to, to me, that's the great thing about game design. There's so many different ways we can approach the same problem. And yes, it's definitely used at university. Mm. Is there any? Oh no, sorry. I, I think um, probably everyone in this room has a phone in your pocket. Yes, and is that phone the last thing you look at before you go to sleep at night? <laughs> and is that phone the first thing that you look at when you wake up in the morning? Don't call me out like this. <laughs> uh, it's, so it's not games that are potentially addictive or potentially like everywhere all the time. We have this human propensity to you know, have these things and, and to obsess with them. We love our media. We want to know what's going on with the other people in our lives. We use them to be social. We use them to be antisocial. Um, and so I'll just echo what Tony said about balance. I, speaking as a parent, I consider it, and I will say this to my kids, it is good for you to learn to swim. It is good for you to like take walks in nature so that you can know what's safe and what's not safe and what's beautiful, like to appreciate the actual world, the place that you're in. But it's also good for you to play Minecraft. And I want you to go sit down with your brother and play Minecraft right now, right? And, and I want you to play together and build something together and work, you know, towards something. Or I want you to sit down and play Overcooked. You will not believe the arguments. <laughs> it will end a marriage, right? <laughs> because it's a cooperative game. You're in a kitchen. You're supposed to cook and everyone has different tools and things. And you need all of them. You know, you have to create an efficiency, right, in order to make it work. Um, you have to leave the room if they're going to play that. But it's so good for them. Like they are learning so many social skills and uh, they're being creative and they're finding solutions to their problems and they're having fun doing it. Yeah. Um, we'll go for another, we'll go for another question, but yeah. Two big ones. Um, um, absolutely agree. Uh, parents play games with the kids, share it with them, enjoy with them, learn with them. You wouldn't teach your child to cross the road if you'd never crossed the road yourself. So enjoy it with them, learn about it, engage with them. Secondly, another positive um, game type thing, your watches that measure how many steps you do. That's, a, that's gamification of fitness. You know, I'll do more steps so that I can get to the number that I want and it's helping me get fit. You the, want the reward of it to go, hey. <laughs> absolutely. Sorry. That's yeah, all. no, I, I mean, talking about Pokemon Go again, there were so many uh, little nerdy kids walking around with uh, phones connected to... I'll say with my nerdy yes. <laughs> Okay, so um, question up the front here. We've just got the microphone for you. Hmm. Yeah. Well, it's worth, um, it's worth exploring, I guess, why that potentially could be. Um, do you have any like particular reasons? Like maybe there's um, like people in the game that you think that you can't be as good at or like why in particular mental health? Start like strange perspectives of how crazy people saw you in the game, and like how people in the game saw the world. I'm talking about Far Cry Five right now, where uh, you're there's this fundamentalist group in like Oregon somewhere, and they're they're taking over the county, and then they're like these far right, um, basically Nazi zealots, 
and like they're the bad guys. <laughs> you want to, I don't know how many games you kill Nazis. At. There's a lot of them. Um, so I don't know if there's, there are not many games that are asking you to identify with a crazy person, but they certainly could. This is why we have media regulation, right? We have people who are going to say, you can't make a game called Custer's Last Stand, which actually was a game and should never have been made. Um, there, there are definitely games that should never have existed, but we have protections in place to say, maybe this shouldn't be something that a child could find, right? Maybe this is the wrong idea to be communicating. Like if Nazis made games, I wouldn't want to see what they'd come up with. That's a good point. You can use um... You can games, indoctrinate. Yeah, games to, to, to push an ideology. Um, there are games that are overly violent, but that's why we have regulation. Just like there are uh, movies and music that can be overly violent. We have and, a rating system. Yeah, so people can write whatever they want and they can give away whatever they want. And some of those things could be horrific types of games, but will that make you bad? Or are you bad because you want to play it? Which is the chicken, which is the egg. Um, is there any other questions for the from the audience? Otherwise, it's good. I can just project. It's okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm just curious about um, there's going to be some research around um, mothers who play games and children of diverse genders who play games, particularly um, I believe it's still quite a male-dominated uh, area. And um, particularly game people who run game companies or game developers and the elite gamers that you've just talked about before are quite male heavy. And what initiatives you're aware of or that you might be taking to support women in, in the game industry? Who wants to start that one? I mean, I, I can start. Um, I know with the company that I work for, Riot, um, there's been some. Uh, issues over the years um, that we've been dealing with internally, and we've been escalating more um, gender minorities into more senior roles to ensure that this doesn't happen, being very careful about, I mean, large companies can easily foster bad behavior, and it can grow out of control one, when one certain group starts to take dominance, like any society, really. Um, so being aware of that uh, within, this company, I know lots of other companies as well that are being a bit more, um, oh, what's the word, uh, positive discrimination, trying to encourage. We have uh, Girls Who Code, which uh, every year we have a, in, in the States, uh, 50, 60 um, uh, non-male people rock up and program on, at, at Wright Campus, which is an amazing campus. And they get some of the best people to help them to, to understand and they get role models and, and they see opportunities through that. Um, and you're right, in, in gaming as well, most of the, the, uh, the top esports teams are male, but we're also pushing to encourage, um, you know, female only groups. Uh, and there are different, part of the problem is that some of the, you know, shooty shooty bang bang games are very, they, uh, they are very attractive to males and less attractive to females. Not to say that don't, that doesn't restrict the players in that way, but, um, so those type of games, which tend to be more male uh, interesting, will be played by males. And so having competitive games like uh, Teamfight Tactics is, is, is a classic one. That doesn't, it's, it's, there's a lot more uh, female players in it that are, are, are higher ranking. Um, it's not as threatening, I suppose. I don't know. But it's still great to watch and, and, and fun to enjoy. Um, but yeah, so oh, there's also an issue within the industry as well, the actual developers themselves. Um, historically, it's been guys, who guys that generally don't have very good social skills as well. Um, as speaking as a programmer, um, <laughs> um, you seem fine. <laughs> years of practice. <laughs> it's 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 about coaching and training and and putting stuff in place to ensure that it's not a toxic workplace. Um, you can get by and you can make a lot of money as a company with a toxic workplace. It's not going to last, but. I think it comes down to, to seniors within the industry, like myself, being able to say, you know, that's not right. Uh, and it's about the companies being held accountable for their misbehavior as well. Um, 
I think things are changing. It's a lot better than it was 20 years ago. Definitely. But it is taking a long time. Anyone else want to? I, th I think it is changing. And I think it's starting now with education, like at, at the like school level, where they are encouraging games as a part of education. And because you're doing it in an inclusive manner, girls and boys and of all gender are actually just engaging. And so we are seeing a lot more, um, you know, not just, it's still quite male heavy, but we're still, we're seeing the growth even in the projects that we're doing. Yeah. There's some studios that have um, been formed around amplifying the voices of marginalized groups. So they, they are LGBT plus trans and female developers who are coming together, um, especially post Gamergate, when many of them were forced from the industry or, or left because it was so toxic. Um, they still want to make games. And so if they make games together, then they can ensure that they're not going to be experiencing those negative life impacts. Um, and, and then I would also say that like companies are reaching out more and more to people like us and asking about these things. So like I have NDAs with several large companies that want to talk about um, inclusion, diversity, and, and better representation. So this is something that is on the minds of people who are already at the table. And then hopefully we're educating, we're making space for, for girls to see themselves as programmers um, and, and to have opportunities to do that. And for us as a society and as parents and grandparents and sisters and brothers and all that, to not be disparaging girls who want to try something as like, oh, that's not masculine. You're never going to get a boyfriend. You can't say things like that, right? Don't, don't say this. Um, encourage them to you know, try those out. Or if they are interested in games or they are playing games, then maybe nudge and say, well, you should take a program programming class or like maybe you should do the summer camp um, and see how you like it. And, or maybe try some games art development. And like that's an entire branch we haven't really focused on much, but like there's programming and then there's the art creation, which is incredible amount of work and, and absolutely necessary. So. so I think we've got time for one more question. Up the front. Else. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, look, I've, I've been here the longest, I think, so in games. Um, it started off, it was one company. Um, and that was back in a time when there weren't many around. But now there is a quite a diverse um, gathering of uh, Australian developers. Um, there's lots of independents coming through. There are collaborative work groups, work environments where they can have desk space and they can work together and they can, they can work with other people. We have companies like Mighty Kingdom and Odd Games and um, Team Cherry and Team Cherry surprised the hell out of me. I had no idea they were from Adelaide. I've never seen the guys involved in that, but they wrote a brilliant game. And another case of if, if they'd said they were gonna do that, I would have said, you got no hope, but it's just brilliant. Oh no, that's, that's Melbourne. Um, uh, um, Oh, oh, what a game. Yes, brilliant game. So it is, it's growing, it's establishing. Um, we don't have a, a big, um, uh, back in the early 2000s, there were large companies, large publishers, the, the whole development model was very different, that, that built larger companies within Australia. With the GFC, they folded. And so from those um, spores of new companies kind of built up and it's, they've grown and they've fallen and they've, grown again and it's I think it's now getting to a point where there are a lot more people either trying to make games and make money out of games uh, than there's ever been before uh, I'm really positive about it I think there's a lot of opportunity now uh, game engines make it easy too easy to make games um, you've got stuff like AIE you've got university topics where you can study the stuff when I grew up there was nothing like that. You only had bananas. You had bananas. <laughs> was it before bananas? Yeah. Eric, what about you? What do you think? Um, what, what's going on currently in the Adelaide gaming space? There was this massive research proposal which wasn't funded on the weekend, which involved games and tourism and event management. And I don't want to talk about it, but um, <laughs> um, I'm new to Adelaide as well. 
so within the last year. But it seems to me there's there's uh, some big markets in tourism here which are just opening up. Um, we've just uh, finished a book on Assassin's Creed in the classroom, history's playground or a stab in the dark, and there's some aspects of it are actually about video game tourism. So overseas, it's actually becoming a big thing. And I was employed or contracted to Tencent, which is arguably the, the largest video game publisher in the world, depending on how you define it. And two years ago, this is before the Chinese government started clamping down on games there, which is last year. They actually, they, they through their games, have been sponsoring the historic fashion network. So people play these Chinese fantasy games, and then they found that the gamers wanted the historic dresses. And so they actually found these historians and fashion designers and, and rebuilt this industry of historically accurate fashion from about three or four centuries ago. And I think these things, these tendrils are beginning to happen around. So Ubisoft, we've basically worked with indirectly. They've moved beyond movies to all these other franchises, et cetera. And the, the game going through mixed reality and augmented reality and tourism and event management and working off databases and architects now using it, urban design, I mean, the question is, where have games not entered their fingers into? I am a little bit scared with some of these things because I, I, to answer some of your questions about um, social awareness, understanding different perspectives, I think games could allow more reflection. And I think partly the academic sector should be involved much more with how can we use games for people to contemplate different ways of looking at things and deciding things rather than just being a person in the cog. Um, but in terms of South Australia, I, I mean, I see lots of opportunities with energy and the environment and a huge new, a huge new growing city, actually. Um, and sport, um, I don't know if it's happened yet. So, you know, these are the Olympics in 10 years time. They are talking about how do people create memories? How do they experience it remotely? That will probably be for a game engine. But also they are trying to have football, um, the World Cup in Australia. And I don't know if they'll succeed, but it's the biggest event in the world. And there will be game game engines involved with that. So to answer your question, I don't know specifically what's happening in South Australia apart from investment in tourism environment. And I think we could do more with military and science sciences. For sure. I think that's probably a good way to end. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming. Um, the next session of Science City is on Tuesday, August 1st. It's for World Breastfeeding Week. So we're going from gaming to breastfeeding, which I think is great. Um, we want to thank Inspiring South Australia for supporting Science City. Um, it's really great that we get to do these every, every month. So feel free to come along to the next one. And thanks, everybody, for coming to this one. Really appreciate having you.